Hello everyone, I'm Alan Hyde and welcome to the third episode of Barking Mad, the official podcast of the British Automobile Racing Club. Now if you're a regular listener to this full throttle racing podcast, then let me be the first to welcome you back. But if you're new around here, it feels only right to provide a little insight into what Barking Mad is all about. Every two weeks, we're hitting the airwaves to bring you the latest news and results from one of the biggest and most prestigious motor racing organisations in the UK, the BARC. We'll also be delving into the hottest topics in world motorsport and talking to the people that live and breathe the sport every day, getting their opinions and sharing the odd tale or two as well. All in all, it's an absolute blast and we're all set to get cracking with episode three, You may have noticed in my introduction, I said we a few times. So without further ado, let me introduce my barking mad co-host. I always laugh when I say that. Ian Waterhouse. Hi, Ian. Uh, Alan, it's great to see you again. Uh, Yeah, we're both pretty barking mad, aren't we? And I have to say, I've missed you because for the first weekend in a row, I didn't actually see you at Trackside. I know. We went our separate ways, didn't we? Goodness me. It's just not the same without you. It's just not the same. No, I know. I had separation anxiety, and I'm sure you did as well. Uh, Well, I'm really looking forward to today's episode, uh, Ian. We've got some great guests lined up. But before we get started, it's time to tell you all about our fantastic partners, where you can invest less on fuel and more on winning. Now, the Barking Mad podcast is proud to be in partnership with BP Fleet Solutions UK. Bark members that sign up for a BP Plus fuel and charge card will have access to fuel at 3,400 stations, getting up to 6p per litre off at 1,200 petrol stations across the UK on both standard and ultimate fuels. So whether you're a business owner that operates a small fleet of vehicles, a race team, or you're a self-employed sole trader heading to a race meeting on the weekend, the BARC BP plus fuel and charge card provides special discounts and competitive prices covering standard grade and ultimate fuels as well yeah now we do say it every time but it really really is a fantastic benefit and the uptake since it was launched has been uh, actually quite incredible if you are a bark member and you're not yet to sign up then why not take advantage of this exclusive member benefit and start saving on fuel by heading to www.bp.com forward slash bark that's b-a-r-c uh, right then it's safe to say that both uh, myself and alan are ready to dive into another packed episode of motorsport chat and can i just say boy oh boy what an episode we've got for you so let's get cracking with it this is the barking mad podcast Now, as always, we kick off every episode of the podcast by discussing the latest news and results from around Bark. And I'm delighted to introduce a man that plays an integral part in the organisation on a day-to-day basis. Yes, he's back, back again. It's event manager, David Whedon. Uh, Welcome back, David. You just can't keep away, can you? Not at all. Afternoon, everybody. (laughs) We're we're very impressed by... um... You've upped the game a bit there, David, from the very first episode of the Barking Mad podcast. You've got a little studio going on there. We have indeed. We've actually had some nice new um, wall murals done, as you can see behind me. And um, my good lady, Nicole, has lent me um, her headphones and very nice microphone. It's very smart. I'm, I'm really Im, Im, impressed by it. But David, it's good because you're at the very heartbeat of the of the club to, to give us all of the info. Now, there are many places to start, David, but it feels right to begin at the BARC's home and the fastest circuit in the UK at Thruxton um, because it was a big, in every sense of the word, weekend as the, the convoy on the plane uh, and the British Truck Racing Championship appeared. Indeed it did, yeah. We had a, a two-day convoy on the plane meeting at Fruxton last weekend um, with the British Truck Racing Championship as the main show as always. Um, Ryan Smith, who we discussed in the previous podcast, took two wins. Stuart Oliver took a win. And um, John Bowler took his first ever Division One race did win um, in the shortened fourth truck race of the weekend. Um, and then in Division Two, we had Paul River and John Powell share the spoils with two wins each. 
How is Paul Rivette getting on this year, David? Because um, I, I have a vested interest, having watched him claim multiple Renault Clio championships, have outings in BTCC cars as well over the course of his career. Um, but he seems to have found a home in truck racing. He has indeed, um, along with um, Wayne and WDE and the, and the, the um, Napa back in. He's really pushed to the front of Division 2 this year. Um, he, he's pushing John Powell um, really hard for the championship this year. I think it's between John Powell, Paul Rivet, and um, Adam Bint this year. Um, but like I said, this weekend we had Paul and, and John take two wins each. So um, going into the next meeting at Donington, it's it's really close in Division Two. You had a big old crowd down there at Thruxton as well, didn't you? Um, yeah, I mean the weather wasn't fantastic on um, Saturday or, or Sunday at all. There was there was a bit of rain, but we did get a lot of dry weather. Um, but um, I have to commend the, the fantastic crowd on both days. Um, they were up on numbers compared to the 2022 Convoy in the Plane event. Um, and considering it was being held on the same Grand Prix, uh, same weekend as the, the British Grand Prix, sorry. And um, we had lots of um, lots of spectators there. We had lots of off-track action, monster trucks, truck displays, fun fair rides. Um, so, so the fact that we, we were up on last year numbers-wise, considering, like I said, it was Grand Prix weekend, um, just goes to show what sort of an event it is and, and, and the fact that it attracts people. Um, year upon year. Uh, we must touch on it, and I'm sure everybody wants to say what a great job all the marshals do uh, trackside, because there was uh, a bit of an incident at uh, Thruxton, wasn't there, with the British Truck Racing Championship. Just uh, just explain a bit about what happened. Yeah, I mean, obviously, most people um, listening to the podcast or watching the podcast will know from social media coverage, et cetera. And um, the meeting was trying one on Sunday afternoon. Um, from an organisational point of view, we had... Um, a race truck that decided to climb over the armco and into the area behind there. Um, and we also had a, a pickup accident on the start line. Um, but I would like to give our fantastic marshals and officials a big thanks, a thanks for their week uh, their work this weekend. Um, they were certainly tasked on several occasions, but as always, they did it with, with professionalism. And, and I have to say a big thank you to them um, for getting us going again on Sunday afternoon. There was plenty of other racing going on as well. And, and Alan David, there was a really nice story actually in the Coupe Cup because uh, Wayne Rocket and Johnny Rocket, father, son, locked out the front row in qualifying. First time they'd ever done it. In race one, I think Wayne won it, and I think Johnny was in third. But then in race two, they finished one-two as well. So for the uh, the two drivers with arguably the best names in motorsport, it was a real family affair and a lot of success, wasn't it, David? Indeed, it was. Um, Wayne and, and Johnny um, are fantastic. Johnny and I actually did our arts courses together. Um here at Fruxton, but um, I've watched Johnny sort of race over the last couple of years from from absolute novice to the point where he's um, getting front row starts and, and getting podiums and um, definitely he pushing his dad, who obviously is one of the, the most successful Coupe Cup drivers we've ever had with regards to race wins. Um, he's, he's probably in at least the top top three, if not maybe overall the, the most successful driver in the series ever. So um, the thing about the Cooper Cup is it's it's proper family affair. Um, it's just people running cars out of the garages, proper club and stuff. Um, uh, and what I like about the Cooper Cup more than anything is, is actually the, the off-track camaraderie between all the drivers is fantastic. Um, specifically a series for that point. So no one can score, score points. Um, so therefore, people aren't battling on track over, um, you know, sixth place to pick a point up here or pick a point up there. So there's some, some um, the driving standards are, are sympathetic to everybody, you know, each driver. Um, so from that point of view, it's a great place for for novices to start and, and Johnny's obviously come from a novice to to getting right up at the front so it just goes show that it can be done yeah absolutely we had the pickups uh pickup trucks there as well didn't we the mg owners the bmw kumas and of course the catering graduates were there too but it wasn't the only action over the weekend was it uh, the northwest center took center stage at alton park david how did that go um, yeah, we had a one-day meeting at Alton Park on Saturday, um, organised by the, the BARC North West Centre, and with the, the CNC Head Sports and Saloons um, taking centre stage, as they are the, the Bark North West Organised Championship. But um, We also had sport from the Junior Saloon Car Championship, Track Attack Race Club, 2CV Parts.com Championship, and we had both of the um, white and green factors of the Adrian Flux Insurance Caterham Academy races um, and all the grids we had at the weekend were showing 25 cars and more CNC hits at 35 cars on the grid so fantastically um, busy little one day meeting we had. 
right now from the racetrack to hill climb. And it's looking more and more likely, David, that Wallace Menzies is going to clinch yet another British hill climb title following another impressive performance at Harewood Hill recently. He's in scintillating form at the moment, isn't he? Yeah, it's um, still the Wallace Menzies show. Um, and it looks like he'll be bagging his, his fourth British hill climb championship title on the trot. Um, with him now being 28 points in the lead of the championship um, post the Harewood Hill meeting. Um, although he didn't have it all his own way, um, his closest challenger, Matthew Ryder, did take a second place in the round 15 top 12 runoff, and he also took a win in the round 16 top 12 runoff. Um, and Scott Moran is also only two points behind Matthew in the standing. So, um, although Wallace does seem to be on his way to his fourth title, he does have um, Matthew and Scott pushing him as hard as possible um, on, on all fronts. Um, one thing I would like to say is at, at the Harewood meeting, we actually had the inaugural round of um, the new British Hill Climb Championship Tin Top Top 10 Challenge. Try saying that when you're drunk. Say it again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the, <laughs> um, but they had a, a really strong entry of um, the fastest sort of tin tops in the country um, for hill climb. Um, and we had a, a battle between Damien Bradley, who also races a lot of circuit racing um, with his two brothers in the BARC. And then um, Stephen Darley, who actually share the car, they actually own and share the car together. They have an 800 horsepower Subaru Legacy, but um, they both managed to take a win a piece in the in the top 10 challenge. So they actually go into the next round in, on the 12th and 13th of August at Chelsea Walsh. Um, not just sharing the car, but also sharing top place in the points table. And it wouldn't be right, David, to uh, not touch upon a meeting, not last weekend, but the previous weekend, uh, the Super Touring Power event at Brands Hatch at the start of the month, um, headlined by the Classic Touring Car Racing Club. Both myself and Ian were in attendance, uh, and I I cannot tell you just how fantastic it, it was. It was a, a proper trip down memory lane, people seeing each other that hadn't seen each other uh, drivers, um, uh, team owners, who, and even current um, people that work, work in the BTCC um, that started their career in the BTCC watching the Super Tourers back, back in the day. Everyone was walking around with a smile on their face. It was such, Ian, wasn't it? It was such a feel-good event. Oh, marvellous. It really, really was. And the crowds, again, we talk about the crowds at Thruxton. The crowds at Browns Hatch for the Super Touring, unbelievable. Yeah, for, for, for CTCRC um, to be able to pull off such a, an event is a testament to their organising team. Um, I have to name some names, but Stuart and Holly Kerr um, and Colin and Sonia Gibbons and all the other individuals that helped to look after um, one of our biggest racing clubs on, on the back roster um, to Put an event on like that, I have to say a big thanks to, uh, thanks to their hard work. Very much so. David, let's just actually go back to Brands Hatch as well, because there was quite an overseas contingent, wasn't there, at Super Taurus? Yeah. Um, I was taking phone calls all times of the day um, from New Zealand. We had a, a large contingent of Super Tourers and drivers um, making their way over from the other side of the world to compete in the event. Um, believe it or not, a massive contingent of the Super Tourer cars are actually in New Zealand. There's about 20 of them out there. Um, and they live out there all year round. But um, we managed to pull um, four or five cars over here. Um, and we also managed to get Greg Murphy, Paul Radisic, Stephen Richards over. Um, so, so I mean, big kudos to them from travelling from the other side of the world. I mean, it took four months to get the cars here on boats. Um, so I have to give a, a big pat on the back to um, everyone from New Zealand who made their way over for the event. And obviously, as we discussed in the in the previous podcast about Jake Hill's um, historic racing prowess um he obviously went on to win all four of the the super uh, touring races over the weekend um sharing the the podium with anthony reed and um, james keller stuart white and jason hughes respectively but we kind of called that one in the last podcast didn't we <laughs> it was absolutely superb it, it, was, it was brilliant alan gale the chief executive of the btcc he's not a huggy person okay he doesn't really do hugs not very happy with it he was hugging everyone at the Super Touring meeting. He, he met friends that he hadn't seen for, for so long. It was just a feel-good meeting. It was lovely. I, I just also, I mean, I just also want to touch on the, the fact that as long as, the, as well as the Super Tourers, and um, we had the pre-66, pre-83, 9303, Thunderboss and Jaguars, um, all of the grids at Don, uh, Brands Hatch were 95% full. 
um, with three of the grids running into reserves. Um, so it just goes to show how strong and popular the, the classic touring car racing club are as, as a racing club and long may it continue. Yeah, super event. Absolutely super. Uh, now, David, before we let you go, um, we've got uh, one other major event to, to have a chat about. Um, by the time this podcast goes out this week, uh, we will be in the midst of uh, the, the 30th Goodwood Festival of Speed. Um, it's an event like no other uh, and one that you, uh, along with the BARC, play a really quite crucial role in the organisation of the event. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, as BARC, I feel that we're very lucky to have such a strong connection with the, the Goodwood Circuit and Estate. Um, the relationship obviously going back to 1949, um, when the circuit had been open for just under a year, and, and we moved our club's offices to there um, post-Brooklyn. So um, also with His Grace, the, the Giga Richmond and Gordon being the BARC president, um, he's involved with all kinds of things with the club alongside the Goodwood uh, connection. It's just good to see such... Um, synergy between the two parties um, and obviously as you said it's it's the um, 30th anniversary of, of Festival of Speed but it's also the 75th anniversary of Goodwood Circuit opening and it's also 75 years of Porsche um, being celebrated this year so um, the 75 years of Porsche is the theme for the, um, the event centre feature sculpture which is just outside the house and um, so it, it, this year's event really is shaping up to be a, a one to remember for all who's going to attend. Now, David, you've worked for BARC for, what, eight years now? And been involved yeah, in, in every years. Goodwood Festival of Speed. Now, we know that the Festival of Speed is all about sort of getting pretty close to to famous names. Go on, drop a few names. Who have you met over the years? Too many. Too many. Um, That's not a good enough answer, David. <laughs> we want names. My, we want my names, first ever, um, <laughs> My first ever Festival of Speed, I got um, a lift up the hill um, from Gordon, who works here at Fruxton. Um, and there's a gentleman sat in the front of the car, and he asked me who I was and what I did, and I explained. And I asked him uh, the same question, and um, it was Valentino Rossi's manager, and he was going up to the top of the hill to meet Valentino. So when we got there, he said, come and meet Valentino. And Valentino Rossi was lovely, but he was stood with Sterling, oh, sorry, Sir Sterling Moss and Sir Jackie Stewart. So um, oh. within a couple of hours of being there, I was stood at the top of the hill with Valentino Rossi, Sir Jackie Stewart and Sir Sterling Moss having a chat with them. A um, pinch me moment. So that, that, was, that was, yeah, just absolutely out of this world. Um, good, Goodwood's a good one for guests as well. I mean, I've met um, Rowan Atkinson, Nick Mason, you name it. I mean, from from my, I mean, obviously, you know, my my other love is music. So to meet people like um, Nick Mason and um, others, it's just, it's amazing. My, I think my favourite moment ever actually was Festival of Speed 2021. Yeah, 2021. Um, I sat and had a, a cup of tea with Mario Andretti. That was pretty special. Oh. Nice. Greatest all rounder in my eyes of all time. That that was a pretty exceptional year. Um, it was the year that I was contacted by somebody at Goodwood. They said, um, "Are you busy over Goodwood Festival weekend?" I said, "No." They said, "Oh, would you like a job?" So I said, um, "Depending on what it is, yeah." And they said, uh, "Okay, well, we we we've got some some pretty cool drivers coming this year, um, and we'd like to do some archive." interviews with them um you know not necessarily to release but to keep um so i said oh yeah no I, I like the idea of that and then on the wednesday of that week they sent me through the list of people that i was going to interview i had an hour sat down with mario andretti an hour sat down with enzo fittipaldi an hour sat down with sir jackie stewart an hour sat down with john mcginnis and seriously where else in the world would you possibly be able to do something like that? Not many places, is there really? Not when you get all those names. Um, one place, one weekend, um, you know, and everyone's everyone's there together. It's um, it is really is a, a blue ribbon event for for us um, as a, as an organising club. Oh, I'm a little bit jealous now. I've got to say, I'm a little bit jealous, chaps. Uh, I will be there at Goodwood this uh, this time around. So hopefully, I'll be able to rub shoulders with uh, the rich, famous and superstars of motorsport like you guys have done. <laughs> you will. You will. It is impossible not to at Goodwood. <laughs> well, well, I work with you, Alan. So, you know, that's, that's, that's good enough for me. 
He says all the right things. <laughs> yeah, David, it's, uh, well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you back on the podcast. I'm sure it won't be the last time either. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and we'll chat again soon. Thanks for having me on, guys. Muchly appreciated. Cheers, David. Thank you. Right then, let's move on and discuss some of the biggest stories and topics that have dominated world motorsport recently. Now, arguably, we've got the perfect person to do this, as he's probably written about just about all of it. Let me introduce you to the editor of Motorsport News and a very dear friend of mine, Matt James. Hello, Matt. Hello, Al. How are you? Very Hello, good Ian. indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on and and joining us. Um, I, I I know um, Motorsport News you cast your gaze and your pen over just about every article that's written in motorsport news. So you're going to be the perfect person to, to talk to us about um, events in global motorsport over the last couple of weeks. Okay. Well, that's, you built me up there, Al, you know, I mean, I might've forgotten it all by now. I've done my best. <laughs> the rest is in your hands. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> you won't have forgotten about it, Matt. And actually, uh, talking to Global Motorsport, it seems a sensible thing to do, doesn't it? To start uh, with Formula One. Of course, it was the British Grand Prix at Silverstone at the weekend. Uh, Matt, what did, what did you make of it all? Uh, well, thank goodness for McLaren and Lando Norris. Um, yeah. Because otherwise, I think we would have had a bit of a damp squib on our hands. And no one saw that coming, which made it even sweeter. Um, you know, the McLaren has had a big struggle this year. If you took the McLaren's performance, him and, and Oscar Piastri, out of the results, you have to wonder, like I say, what, what kind of a race we might have had. But, you know, thankfully, we had a belter in the end. It's not the first time we've asked this question in about Formula One. Is a, a Red Bull going to win every race this season? No, no, they won't win every race this season. Um, just because of the fact that something will trip either one of them up at, at, at a, a stage this season. Yeah, you know, the, the record is 15 out of 16, isn't it, McLaren? And, and, you know, you could see them winning 15, but then the season's a lot longer these days. There's more chances to trip up and slip up. Um, yeah, and it's not beyond the realms that both cars could break down. We saw that last year. It happened on a couple of occasions. Um, but the momentum behind Max at the moment is such that he's, it's, it's very hard to bet against him unless something unusual happens, like a double retirement or, you know, there was a threat of rain at Silver, so a mixed strategy... Could, could possibly throw a curveball in there. Although, having said that, how often have we seen Red Bull get the strategy calls right where everyone else gets them wrong? Yeah, we had Christian Horner do um, uh, a couple of interviews, appearances on the on the, uh, the Chrome main stage at Silverstone at the weekend. He's become very naughty. He doesn't mind using Does naughty words in, in front of the crowd. And um, we were taking them on uh, Radio Silverstone, and all of a sudden, huge panic in the, in, in the studios. We go, ah, that's gone to air. Um, yeah, he keeps um, uh, reiterating his uh, his phrase from the meeting with uh, Toto Wolf and and the rest of them, and um, when he refers to the uh, to the Mercedes car, and uh, clearly the the crowd like it, so he repeats it multiple times. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, if if someone's becoming uber successful, it's very uh, it's very easy to think of them as boring. So maybe he's just trying to put a bit of an edge on himself. <laughs> I suppose that's a very good point. Can I just, um, uh, while we're on the subject of, of the Grand Prix at the weekend and McLaren, um, it is quite remarkable if you think the point at which we started the season with that car, and and to have got to this point by the time we get to Silverstone, that was that was the slightly mind-blowing thing that happened over the course of the weekend. Absolutely. But, you know, it's not only McLaren. You have to look at the developments that Williams has made as well. I mean, you know, across the... Okay, it didn't translate into an, a mega race result. But if you look at the pace of Alex Albon and indeed Logan Sargent over the course of the three practice sessions, they were really, really on it. Uh, they were in the top 10. And, you know, Alex had a, a battling sort of eighth place, could have been, could have been seventh place. The progress of those two teams has been astonishing, uh, but you almost got the impression, particularly in McLaren's case, that as soon as the new car went testing in Barcelona, they forgot about it and started making updates for the latter part of the year because they knew they, they, they simply couldn't rescue the situation. Put all their efforts into developing you know, an upgrade, which, which came uh, just before Silverstone actually came for the last Grand Prix in Austria, um, and it really has turned them around. 
Although I do find it fascinating that teams are able to have such wholesale changes when we're meant to be under a budget cap, of course, a limitation on the money they can spend. This was the thing that was hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully from those who don't support them, was going to trip up Red Bull because they had their penalty hanging over them with a reduction in wind test tunnel time, uh, wind tunnel test yeah. time, I should say, and all that sort of stuff. And everyone was using that as a bit of a chink of light. Well, they maybe will not be able to progress their car so quickly throughout the course of the season, as we've seen with McLaren and Williams. But the problem was Red Bull came out with an absolute stonker right from the start. Matt, what's going on with Ferrari? Because, you know, looking outside in, 18 months ago, they started last season with arguably the fastest car on the grid. And 18 months later, they don't really seem to be making much progress. No, and last year, the, the sort of finger was pointed at Mattia Bonotto for some sort of uh, what you would call um, organisational problems and uh, strategy problems. You know, it was all in the background. Everyone thought that, uh, that you know, that's, that's the thing that needed to be eradicated because the car was quick at the start of last year. Yeah. Um, so he, he bit the bullet in, in December and in comes Freddy Vasseur. The strategy mistakes are still there. Um, they're still making blunders. They, they've done it a couple of times this year. And you would argue that this year's car actually isn't quite as fast as last year's was. We've seen a few unforced errors from Charles Leclerc as well. I mean, if you think back to the Grand Prix in Miami in qualifying, um, it just is the things are, are almost clicking together, but just just not quite. And, I, you know, they, they are struggling compared to Red Bull, as everybody is. But then when you throw another couple of cars in the mix, like a quicker Mercedes, the McLarens now, um, things like that, it's going to be harder and harder for them. I was a little bit disappointed, um, uh, bearing in mind the, the first Grand Prix of the, of the season, the opening um, part of the season, um, with the performance of Aston Martin at the weekend. Is it because everybody else has, has got better and better and, and they maybe have stayed in the same place? Yeah, I, I would say you're right, Al, because, you know, we, as I say, McLaren's jumped up the order. Williams has jumped up the order. Aston's maybe dropped down a little bit. They put a lot of effort into their MR23. It's a fantastic looking car. And, and I was quite encouraged after the first couple of rounds because it worked on circuits that were vastly different from each other. It worked at Monaco, for example, and it also worked at really quick tracks mm -hmm. like Jeddah. So you thought, OK, here we go. You know, this is going to be like a, a season long um, attempt from both of them. But it just you know mercedes has taken a step forward other interlopers are getting into the picture and they're gradually taking a step back to to have a grand prix a full grand prix as we did at silverstone with 52 laps and you hardly mentioned fernando alonso at all is something you yeah. wouldn't have thought possible yeah. after the first couple of races would you and it'd been so beautifully received by by the crowd at silverstone in the in the run-up to to getting the grand prix underway it was um yeah a bit of a disappointment and bearing in mind they've got this beautiful new facility which is built just over the road from from silverstone it's quite interesting actually i i, I was involved in the um in the uh from an uh sound engineering point of view i was involved in the aston martin launch um at the start of the year well i thought and you were going to be involved in, the, involved in the build of the factory al <laughs> no i've i've had no part in the building of the factory um Good. but i was Good. there for the, for, for the launch at the start of the year and it was it was quite incredible. I think it was about three o'clock that I was in the room uh, where um, uh, um, both of the drivers were about to, to give a press conference. And um, and the time came and one minute to uh, the door open and Lance walked in, first of all, beaming and smiling as, as he, he always does. Um, and Fernando walked in absolutely worn out. He looked completely and utterly shattered. And I thought, well, this is weird for a Formula One launch wasn't until later I realised he'd been in the simulator all day. It was valuable yeah. time that he could spend at the factory and therefore he was making the most of it. That's um, There's a champion right there, isn't there? Absolutely, yeah. No, that shows you his class, doesn't it? And, of course, there was an 11th team at the uh, at the Grand Prix over the course of the week. Oh, poor old Matt. He looked ever so puzzled there. I thought, was there? No, there, there definitely was. Um, because it was uh, uh, Brad Pitt and the Apple TV uh, film that's being centred around Formula One that was filming at Silverstone. I would be fascinated to see the fly-on-the-wall documentary as to how that was filmed and integrated to the actual action that was going on. It was interesting. Yeah, I think what's um, what's pre what's noticeable about that is how outward-looking Formula One bosses have become. 
Mm. Um, because previously, anything like this, you know, they'd have turned their nose up to it, walked away from it and said, no, nope, you're nothing to do with us. But if you look how ingrained this Apple TV Brad Pitt project is with Formula One, getting a car on the grid, for example, getting picked, you know, that's the sort of access that's never, ever happened before. And I wonder if, you know, the, the prevalence of um, Netflix documentaries and what have you, the audience is going to demand something that's more authentic now because they perhaps know a little bit more about it. And, and but, you know, taking a wider view of it, what a, what a great thing for our sport that a, a global household name such as Brad Pitt has taken on this project. You know, the more doors we can open and the more people can get eyes on the sport, it, it's going to be better for all of us, isn't it? He was behind the wheel of the car as well, wasn't he? My understanding is that he was actually uh, going around Silverstone with with the helmet on, which is which is brilliant. And there have been a few movies over the years, haven't they, trying to sort of capture the spirit of Formula One. Um, but this one looks like it, it, we could be onto a bit of a winner here. Yeah, I hope so, because the ones that have gone before have, have been very inauthentic and rubbish. Um, you know, everyone harks back to, to Le Mans, you know, the great Steve McQueen film in, in the early 70s as the benchmark. Um, so, you know, it's been nearly 50 years since we've had something that most sport fans can be proud of, as well as, you know, onlookers. The more recent Le Mans film was pretty good, wasn't it? It was pretty good. Not enough racing in it for me, Al. So, so, so I have an interesting story about that, not surprisingly. Um, I had taken <laughs> my car into a place in, in Wandsworth uh, to have some work done to it. And they told me that the, the work would take a, a couple of hours. Um, so I thought, well, what am I going to do? Kick around Wandsworth for a while. So I went, I went into the, to, to the precinct and they had a big cinema there and it was showing that film. So I thought, oh, OK, well, well, that will kill the time. What I didn't realise was the cinema that I went into um, was called an extra cinema or something like that. Um, and the seat moved around. It sprayed me with water. It blew wind on, <laughs> on me. And, and worryingly, as a middle-aged man, I was the only man in there. <laughs> it was the middle of the day. Yeah. <laughs> on a yeah, weekday. Okay. I, to be honest... So that's I never happened to you before, Al, no? <laughs> so never, never. Only when I went to watch the Minions film, but that's a completely different story. Um, <laughs> we should move on. We should move on. Yeah, Matt, one thing that has probably uh, kept your desk very busy over the last few months is the two dreaded words of track limits. Uh, it has been a constant theme, hasn't it, across championships. Uh, now, if I cast your mind back to the Austrian Grand Prix, apparently there was a uh, supposed 1,200 track limit infractions. Uh, as, as I said, I'm sure this is something you've had to report on quite a bit. What's your take on it all? Uh, I'm as confused as everybody else. Firstly, I mean, it's obviously, there's two different rules. There's there's rules for international motorsport, such as Formula One, and then there's the rules in the UK. And the ones in the UK are what we've focused on mainly. Um, I honestly, honestly don't know the answer to this. I mean, it's quite simple to say, well, put a, a gravel trap right up to the edge of the back of the curb, and then that'll, that'll catch people when they fall off. But think of the amount of race stoppages, red flags, safety cars that that would actually prompt. I mean, you, you would ruin the sport completely if you did that. Um, you can't give them free reign because drivers will use as much as they, they want to. You can't lower the curbs and then put grass on there because the motorcycle racers obviously have to use the circuits as well. And that's something that their governing body, you know, they want they want flat curbs. They don't want sausage curbs, sorry, that, that drivers can't go over. There's so many things to take into account. You know, other it's, it's, it's very flippant to say, or oh, put a brick wall there, it never happens at Monaco. Um, but... <laughs> I don't know. There, there has to be some responsibility taken from the drivers. But they're also, the, the biggest problem with it is, F1 doesn't suffer from this problem, but what national race, motorsport needs is a way of judging a call on a consistent basis so that everyone who does transgress is penalised. Because at the moment, it's quite arbitrary. Um, you know, the theory being that it's, it's like getting caught speeding on the motorway. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. Um, and it's, you know, that's what they're saying about track limits. You might get penalised, you might not. But in a sport which is counting hundreds, thousands of a second, and, and in a sport where so much money is spent and, and it needs to be a sporting contest, having a sort of a grey area and a maybe you will, maybe you won't is, is simply not good enough. And there's surely it's got to be some technology that we can introduce to, to outlaw this. But also, I think another one of the problems is at some circuits, it's only observed at some places. It's not observed yeah. throughout the whole track. So if you're going to have a rule, it needs to be observed in every single part of the circuit as well. There are much cleverer brains than I that come up with a solution for this. Um, but I would have thought in the modern world of technology, there's, there's got to be an answer. 
that we can use that is value for money enough so that it can be used right through club racing, not just the top level stuff like BTCC and, and British GT. It needs to be used by, um, you know, BARC clubbies and 750 meetings, whatever. So I don't know the answer. I know the problem. Um, just hoping that someone cleverer than me can find a solution. I suppose if you are a club racer then and you know certain corners are being monitored and a certain area of the track isn't, if you are taking advantage of the track at those positions, is that technically cheating or, or is it just, well, if it's not being monitored, I'll do whatever I like? Would you, would you call it cheating if you got caught speeding? Uh, <laughs> good question. Similar Definitely. thing, isn't it? Yeah. I know you would, Al. Yeah, well, that's top, that's top end for you, 70 mile it, an hour. Absolutely mate. it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, you know me so well. Well, I mean, I'm not a particular engineering brain, but you've got the wall of the tire, and if the wall of the tire had a wire around it with a chip, and there was a wire all the way around the perimeter of the circuit, surely there would be some way of making um, some kind of some kind of sensor that because it, it feels like a yeah, really I, simple, I, I think a simple that, fix. Yeah. The big thing people will say is money. Um, you know, who, who's mm. going to pay for yeah. putting a wire in all the track? Who's going to put pay for putting a wire in? You know, if you're a club racer that's racing on road tyres, for example, who's going to put a chip in the, in the side of that? It's you know, there, there's so many elements to take take into account. You know, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, if you go back 30, 40 years, and I'm, I'm not aware of this being a problem. So, what did people used to do then? Someone will tell us, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is that rhetorical, or do I have to think of an answer? Yeah, it's, it's rhetorical. I'll stop there, Al. Well, <laughs> Thank goodness for that. I have a few theories of my own, but I, I don't want to get bogged down in that because, um, unfortunately, we have to come on to slightly more serious uh, matters because over the last few weeks we've seen the sad passings of two people at the opposite ends of their motorsport careers. Uh, Delano Van Toff uh, tragically died at Spa whilst competing in Ford Formula Regional um, and Team Dynamics founder and uh, BTCC stalwart Steve Neal also passed away, uh, Matt, at the age of 82. Yeah, and, and, and Al, uh, do you want to tell the stories about my relationship with Steve Neal or, or shall I? No, I, I'm quite happy for, 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 for you to tell the stories. Yeah, obviously, having covered the BTCC for 20 years, I got to know Steve extremely well and um, we, we sort of clashed, uh, clashed on several occasions about various different things. Um, but I think w the evidence of that, w which really impressed me, because even in the, in the latter stages of him running the team, it just showed what a passionate man Steve was about motorsport, um, what I wrote about motorsport particularly, um, hit the success of his team and, and the British Touring Car Championship, of which, of course, he, he'd been a racer in the past himself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was such a loyal supporter of the championship. If you look at the, the dedication, the effort and the professionalism that that team brought to the BTCC from its humble beginnings, it, it really did, you know, kind of set a new level, you know, if you like, in the, in the mid part of the 2000s. And, and Team Dynamics, before Honda came along, were a private team taking it to the work squads that were out there, yeah. you know, in a, in a way that no one else really did. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and they embraced it with such enthusiasm, such fun. You know, there was always, apart from when I upset Steve and written something bad, um, there was always an element of fun, and they knew they were going motor racing for the right reasons. Um, and that was something which was which was absolutely you know prevalent with him all just, the time. Now, just to be clear about that, Matt, um, when 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 you did have your little fallouts, and sometimes they went on for a little while. Sometimes I remember you weren't allowed in the garage, and but you but you did end up making up at the end of each of those little yeah. episodes didn't you yeah we always did we always became friends again and you know and i think that just shows that there was a common love of what we were doing we were just both basically coming at it from different angles um yeah which is uh which is which was interesting and danilo van toff the spa one um really knocked everybody sideways uh i was talking to uh david addison commentator he was he was at the circuit and i think it it was it's just another stark reminder that 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 racing is a, is a very cruel sport sometimes. Um, there has been a lot of reaction, even Formula One drivers comment, commenting about, you know, what we should do with Spa and all this sort of stuff. I know it's just, it's tough. You don't want to take those challenges away from racing drivers because those are the bit of the sport that they enjoy the most. Yes, we need to look at every aspect of that accident. And yes, we need to see if there are lessons that can be learned. 
but please don't anesthetize the circuits because those are the corners that that racing drivers get out of bed for um and those are the things those are the challenges we love to watch and the drivers love to do so i think there needs to be a little bit of circumspection on on what they do in the future going forward final word on steve neil matt uh, which you may or may not know um but the news broke um uh, during the super touring power meeting at, at brands hatch so um i got the news and delivered the news and then the decision was made because um the team dynamics nissan primera from 99 mm-hmm. the one that uh won the team and matt neil 250,000 pound for being a an independent winner um was uh, rather poignantly and rather beautifully pushed to the front of the grid um just as a a little nod to steve um before the uh, before the race got underway on sunday so that was um that it's, it's funny how these things happen and and they kind of coincide with something that's that's we just happen to have his 99 nissan primera there so so we're going to going to put it at the front of the grid i wonder if that'll be called the steve deal trophy in future it would <laughs> well yeah. wow yeah there you go. You're an ideas man, Matt. You always have been. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, okay. we'll put that to Stuart then, uh, shall we? Classic touring cars. Uh, uh, Matt, let's uh, turn things to a slightly uh, happier note, shall we? Touch on touring cars there. And one story, uh, albeit linked to the other side of the world, that's well worth discussing, is three-time supercars champion uh, Shane Van Gisbergen and becoming the first driver in 60 years to win on debut in NASCAR uh, on a street circuit in Chicago, no less. Yeah, um, I... I... I've heard nothing but great things about Shane Van Gisbergen. and he's, he's absolutely super talented. Um, he, apparently he's quite sleepy and docile outside of the car and, and you'd almost think he's not listening to debriefs and what have you, but stick him in a car uh, and he's, a, he's an absolute animal. I love what NASCAR's doing in, in getting overseas races to come and take part. You know, we've had Kimi Reckon and Jensen Button, Shane Van Gisbergen, and they're all, they're all having a crack at it. Um, it's, just, it's just brilliant and it, it really is opening the, the wider world's eyes to Formula One, but I think it goes to show you that Aussie Touring Cars is, is a proper proving ground, you know. Um, it, it really has delivered some some high-class talent. Look at what Scott McLaughlin is doing as well. People, previously, people like Marcus Ambrose. Uh, it's a great series, and, and we'd all love to go and uh, go and watch around if the invite to uh, just send it to Alan Hyde and we can all go. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to really put you under the magnifying glass now. Um, extreme E. Um, continued to grow in stature this year and uh, latest rounds saw it take centre stage in Sardinia. Um, have you bought mm-hmm. into the concept, Matt, of Extreme E and what the championship is? Am I allowed, is am I allowed to say no? Trying to achieve. You can say your opinion. That is what the Barking Mad podcast is all about. <laughs> yeah, it. it, it mm, I, I'm, I'm not really. No, sold I think on you've it. said enough, um, Matt, to be honest. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think we've got the, the racing gist of I've it. Watched is quite good. The racing I've watched is quite good, and there are some are some quite spectacular shunts. But for me, the races are too short, and they're not on proper stages or tracks. So uh, that's where my interest kind of stops. Right there, we go. Short and succinct. <laughs> <laughs> I try my best, Al. A bit like me. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Uh, well said, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, before we let you go, what we're doing with all of our guests is we are building the ultimate racetrack. So we are asking every single guest, yeah, absolutely, to uh, pick a corner, your favourite corner from any circuit in the world, and it will go, uh, it will form part of our racetrack. Uh, Matt, what are you going for? Well, mine is a little section of circuit because they, they, they sort of, they have to be together. And it would be Duffer's Dick at Rock Hill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, knew I absolutely it, love that. I, I, I knew it was going to be so, either that or something from Cadwell Park. I said said to the boys this morning, <laughs> I, I am absolutely certain. <laughs> Alan knows us all a beer now or two, don't you, Alan? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I said, what did I what did I say from Cadwell Park? Yeah, it was that gooseneck you Cadwell said, Park. didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Uh, good. <laughs> cool. <laughs> brilliant, Matt. Absolutely brilliant. Um, well, that's some of the biggest stories in World Motorsport Discuss. Matt, thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, hopefully you'll be a friend of the podcast and come and join us again because uh, uh, your insight is is valued and has been uh, extremely amusing in places as well. So, Matt, thank you. Great guest. Thanks very much, guys. See you later. Thank you, Matt.
It's now time to welcome a very special guest onto the podcast who arguably needs no introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. He is the driving force behind Goodwood's motoring exploits and uh, the president of the BARC. Welcome to the Barking Mad podcast, the Duke of Richmond and Gordon. Uh, it's a bit of a busy week for you this week, isn't it? Thank you for taking the time out. Um, we're going to dive straight in with the Goodwood Festival of Speed, which by the time uh, this podcast goes to air, it's going to be well and truly in full swing. Uh, it's a hugely special event. This year is no different. Um, it is the 30th anniversary of the Goodwood Festival of Speed. What sort of glimpse into what we've got planned for this year can you give us? Well, as you say, it's a very big, um, it's 30 years of the Festival of Speed. It's also 75 years Alan, of uh, motorsport at Goodwood. So that's our kind of overarching theme, if you like. And of course, the Festival of Speed uniquely um, covers all genres of, of, uh, of, of motorsport, all genres of the motor car, actually, really. And, um, and, and of course, covers both the past, 100 years of the past, the present, and uh, looking well into the future with our Future Lab and other, and other initiatives. So um, we've got a massive lineup and we've got some fantastic other anniversaries too. Um, so we're certainly more rammed than we've ever been. <laughs> it's going to be busier than ever. I think in terms of content, for sure, we've got um, a lot of the F1 teams here too, but it's 75 years of Porsche, which is a very big one. So uh, this will be Porsche's biggest celebration, I think, in the world. Um, for that, and it's 60 years of McLaren, so we've got every major McLaren driver, every car, everything, that they're all, that they're all going to be here as well. And it's 75 years of Lotus as well, so, and a big, big Lotus uh, celebration too. Uh, so there's a, there's a hell of a lot going on. And the other really big and exciting thing for me, actually, is um, that we've got our first year when we don't clash with MotoGP, and um, Dorna, MotoGP, the whole, the whole crowd, so MotoGP as a complete entity is picking itself up and coming to Goodwood. So we've got, um, you know, we've got Banyaya here. We've got wow. all, the, all the big teams. Um, so we're very, very excited. First time that's happened. So that's a big thing for our 30th anniversary. Every year it's so tricky for you um, uh, uh, organising the date for the Festival of Speed because um, the idea, uh, if people don't know, um, to be close to the British Grand Prix is pretty much essential because uh, it, it allows Formula One teams to, to, to be at Festival of Speed. And for so many people, that's, um, that's what they, they look forward to. The access to Formula One teams, machinery and drivers is, is pretty much like no other at Goodwood, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's not so much, actually. It, bizarrely, it isn't, it isn't really that they need to be here so much. It's just we don't want to clash with it, obviously. And it's just the time of year we do it. It's always around you know, It's always around the British Grand Prix, but it is helpful. We'd rather be probably just just before it, um, mm. rather than after. But uh, there were various... This year, it's all quite late. Uh, this year, everything's late. Our horse racing's uh, late, which makes everything late in a way. So... Um, and we had Le Mans to contend with as well. So a big, obviously, 100 years of Le Mans. That's another, another, big, another big anniversary yes, of ours. Yeah. This year, too, we'll have all those guys here. We'll have the Ferrari here, which, is, which won, um, with the winning wow. drivers, too. So that would be pretty spectacular. Goodness me. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, I would like to take you back, because it is 30 years since the festival started, and uh, uh, many, m many of us remember um, the I I inaugural event 30 years ago. Um, when you came up with the idea um, and, and then alongside the BARC actually put it into practice, did you have any comprehension that it would grow into the event that it is now 30 years later? No, absolutely no, of course not. No, no, no idea. We, 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 um, we were told actually the first year, I think we'd be lucky if we got 2,500 people as a general feeling of it. I think we got about 25,000 that first year. So that took us all a bit by surprise. Um, people kind of burst into the fences and stuff. And uh, we don't really know how many we had actually even that first year. But um, so that was a surprise and a very positive, you know, it was a great thing. It was a very positive message that we were doing something that people were excited about. And, um, and they just grown and grown actually. I mean, it's been capped at this number for a long time. But um, uh, this year we will absolutely, if, you know, Thursday is a sellout too, it's all completely is a complete sellout so uh that's really encouraging i think people seem to be more and more excited and interested in motorsport than ever before so that's also great i mean to see something grow steadily over 30 years um 
in terms of revenue has been interesting. I mean, it's just carried on. You know, it just keeps on getting a bit, you know, it keeps on doing its business in a way. And when you did come up with the original plan all those years ago, um, it, it was the BARC, uh, uh, naturally, if you like, that, that you you started the event hand in hand with, wasn't it? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and my relationship with the BARC was um, w- was absolutely vital. And it was actually Ian Bax, who was a, 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 a committee member of the BARC, um, who suggested me originally. So it was Ian, really, who said originally, you know, you should look at running a hill. I think I was talking about getting the track open again and things. He said, you should look at running a hill climb in front of the house. I mean, obviously, he had a slightly different idea of what, what that would be. It was it would have been a more traditional kind of um, hill climb competition, I think. And then we have, we're having all this trouble at the motor circuit getting that um, up and running again, or trying to even, having those discussions with the local authority. Um, and then uh, I got uh, the, the FIA uh, track inspector uh, came back, Derek Ngaro came down, and Derek became a good friend, and he was looking at the, uh, Derek was looking at the circuit in relation to what we might need to do to get that in any way sort of ready and 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 and, um, a, 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 and sort of even possible to race on, and giving me some advice on what that might mean. Not that we, not that, that was in any way near to happening, but he was looking at that. Um, and I said, oh, I've had this idea for this other thing. What do you think about this? And I took him to the house and we drove it. And he said, well, looks like we were going to go from the anyway, a different route, first of all, from the kennels up and round the stables and up past the front of the house. He thought it looked very quick. And then he said, well, maybe this would work differently. We went down to the hotel and did it from there. He said, I think that will work. Um, and then Derek was close to Dennis Carter, um, who was really, and it was really Dennis and Derek. You know, if they hadn't agreed it all, or if they hadn't thought it was a good idea at the beginning and kind of thought, created a, a situation where it was kind of, yes, how can we make this work? How can we, you know, let's, let's fight through all these challenges rather than just say no, um, it would never have happened. And um, Derek certainly got a bit of, you know, those early years, he got a bit of, I would say, you know, a few raised eyebrows as to what on earth <laughs> he was doing. I mean, it was a string that first year, literally just a piece of string. And he said, it's like a rally stage, it's fine. And Dennis, of course, was hugely supportive and you had to have an organising club, so naturally it was going to always be the BARC. Um, and they did, a, you know, they were hugely supportive, did, did, did a great job. But absolutely, uh, Dennis was absolutely critical at the beginning. If he hadn't been so positive and so keen to see it happen and so flexible uh, and um, so generally uh, helpful and uh, really you know, look, really looking for ways to sort of around problems, it, it, it would never have happened. And, um, and without him and Derek together, uh, certainly it wouldn't have happened. So it was a bit of a miracle, really. Your Grace, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier, of course, it's the 75th anniversary of motorsport at Goodwood. Uh, there's been quite a few incredible moments over the years, hasn't there? Is there anything that stands out for you personally as a particular favourite moment? Gosh, that's, yeah, that's a bit of a, uh, the, the, so there are so many, yeah. Um, but, you know, that first year was a big moment. Seeing the V16 BRM go up, everyone crying when they saw it, that was a big moment. Yeah, I was like, definitely, we got something here. No one had seen one for so many years. Seeing Moss and Jenks in the 300 SLR, that was a big moment. Having the W165 Mercedes run, the first time it had run since it ran at one at Tripoli in the 1930s, that was pretty, um, you know, Car. I mean, we've had more, I mean, the amount of cars that have run for the first time again, or even for the first time ever, and things here at Goodwood is uh, yeah. extraordinary. But when you think, um, you know, in the last 30 years, without any doubt, there'd be more great cars here than anywhere else in the world. I mean, more great cars have graced this little patch of Sussex, weirdly, than anywhere else in the world by a mile. I mean, nowhere else can come close to it, really. Um, so that's, that's quite extraordinary, really. Um, and we've had, you know, we've had some, you know, we've had some great, and we've had some fun moments. You know, Peter Fonda doing the Easy Rider moment. Lots of, yeah. you know, they're just things that sort of stick out for me because they're, they're things I guess which have required a lot of effort or cars which have required a massive amount of you know, getting the first auto union here. Now we see them all the time. But I mean, those first, getting one here for the first year when 
they were all in East Germany, and you couldn't, you know, there weren't any, just no one had one. Um, it, those were, those were um, trying to, you know, get these cars, find where they were, get them here, all that, getting the first cars, from, all the cars from America, all the, you know, Richard Petty, all, the whole NASCAR thing, bit of a breakthrough, getting the Americans to come, and, and um, you know, we, we, we obviously shipping all those cars and everything, and um, is a, is a big is a big commitment, but that's something we do every year. And that was a good decision to you know, ship the cars, bring them all over. Um, getting Jim Hall here with the Chaparrales was a huge. I mean, I've driven I've driven you know the Chaparral with the wing, um, the two E I think it is, and I've driven the two H as well. Um, but you know, hardly anyone's driven those cars ever in the world. I mean, they've only ever had sort of three drivers anyway or something. So very honoured, and I've obviously driven some fantastic cars. It's, it, it's also quite wonderful to see drivers in a more informal atmosphere, catching up friends. They have the opportunity to do that um, in, in the house, in Goodwood House on Saturday night. You have uh, uh, this amazing uh, ball every every year on the Saturday, um, which has had actually over the course of uh, 30 years, has had a few musical moments uh, over its uh, history, hasn't it? Some pretty um, astonishing musical moments as well. Yeah, we've had some great bands. We've we've been very lucky. I mean, one of the one of the um, one of the joys is that music and cars seem to go together pretty well. So a lot of the musicians are keen to come, um, and they've been very generous. We've had some yeah, we've had some big 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 people here. That's for sure. Um, we're doing a big Jeff Beck moment actually. This I mean, Jeff played here a few times. Mm. Um, he had, did a sensational concert a couple of years ago. He did the party about two years ago. It took me about 10 years to persuade him to do it. Um, that was fantastic. And of course, he tragically, just tragically died earlier in the year. So we're doing a Jeff Beck sort of tribute. And um, there are a few famous musicians going to be here for that. Too. I bet there I bet there are. <laughs> I bet they're queuing up to be part of it as well. And they're also hot rod owners too, the musicians. So we've got a few musicians in hot rods and things doing. Um, I've just seen a very, very, very big sound system going up on top of the house. So it must be something to do with that, I think. Um, <laughs> very cool. Um, uh, now, uh, of, of course, festival is one part of the uh, motorsport at, at Goodwood. Um, uh, revival takes place as ever in September. That's marking a special milestone as well. That's a unique event, isn't it? The first time that... Um, that certainly I knew of um, essentially the first year of Goodwood Revival. It's also a, a huge period event. It's um, uh, That is, again, a, a hugely unique event. It's the only major sporting event in the world that takes place in this whole sort of period theme. Everyone is a vintage. Everyone dresses in, in real vintage kit. Um, and um, it's uh, that, that that's a, an important part of, of the whole experience. Um, and it's the twenty fifth the sorry yeah it's the it's the twenty fifth year anniversary of revival too this year so um, it's another 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 big anniversary we've got some other you know great celebration doing a very big later celebration at at uh, revival too. Now your grace we have touched a little bit on your ties obviously with uh, Bark here but as its president how special is it to hold that title and what does the British Automobile Racing Club mean to you? Oh, well, I'm very honoured to be the president. My um, my grandfather, of course, was the president first, and um, uh, well, not president, but well, president before me, um, and um, uh, he was very caught up in its history, obviously, with uh, good with being the sort of circuit after Brooklyn's after the war, first track to open after the war, yeah. and everything else. So very much, I guess, in that sense, you know, the family's played a bit of a history in the in the BARC. So. You know, I was very delighted. Obviously, I was I was delighted to be asked, and but that was way before anything was happening at Goodwood. Funny enough, so I was always keen on cars and and motor racing, and and then um, uh, I was asked if I'd like to be present. Not, you know, it wasn't easy to ask my grandfather. Um, uh, there were some others between, but uh, it was a uh, it was um, you know I think my grandfather would have been pleased, and. Um, he had uh, he had died by then, and um, obviously it worked out incredibly well. And uh, you know we we then we then 
they were very involved with Goodwood initially with him, and then it all fired up again. They became very involved again with Goodwood with me. Well, if you're into, obviously, your cars and motorsport, as we know, what we've been doing on the Barking Mad podcast is asking all of our guests to name a particular favourite corner. So we're building out a race circuit throughout the course of the podcast, and we're asking everybody to name, add a corner to our race circuit. And it can be a corner at Goodwood. So is there a particular standout corner for you? Um, well, I think I enjoy Magic the most. It's a really exciting, it's the first corner. Yeah. Um, so you approach it pretty fast. This is a double apex corner. It's got a, it's got, a, it's got a kind of dip in the middle of it too. We looked at taking the dip out actually when we, we've never rebuilt the circuit anyway. The, the circuit's exactly the same as it was when it was built, but when we re it, which we've only done once, it, um, we looked at whether that should be in any way amended, and it was decided it definitely shouldn't be. Uh, cause you go and you get this dip, which then sort of takes you through the second apex, which is a really, really, if you get it right, it's a really nice feeling. It's not so good if you get it wrong. <laughs> I um, imagine yeah. not. <laughs> you end up in there. I mean, all, all, all the corners of Goodwood aren't very forgiving. If you come off, you're going to probably whack, you know, whack something. Um, but that's a very, very satisfying corner. And of course, yeah, Goodwood's very, very fast. You know, it's really only Lavent that you've got to, yeah. it's Lavent's the only real corner, actually. So it works very well for your old, old cars too, because you're not, you're, you're not on the brakes all the time. But no, I think Magic would be my, um, would be my most exciting corner. it will be fun to pop that in on our, yeah, we'll put that put Good. that in the circuit for the end of the year. Your Grace, we could sit and discuss all things Goodwood and BARC for hours, but we understand you've got a a, a bit on this week, a bit of a busy schedule. Um, so uh, can we just say thank you so much for uh, giving us your time and joining us here on the Barking Mad podcast, and we wish you and Goodwood all the very best. Thank you. Brilliant. No, thanks so much. I hope we'll be seeing lots of everybody um, at the weekend. And thanks a lot. Thank you. Good to chat. Ian, that's sadly all we've got time for in this episode of the Barking Mad podcast. But before we go, we've got another message from our fantastic partners, BP Fleet Solutions UK. Now, if you're en route to race or spectate this weekend, don't forget that the partnership between Bark and BP Fleet Solutions UK goes beyond conventional fueling solutions. BARC members can now embrace the transition to electric power more easily, thanks to the added convenience and savings offered by the BARC BP card. Visit bp.com slash BARC to find out more. And thank you again to our partners BP for supporting the UK racing community. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, BP. And if you are a Bark member and you haven't signed up, then do not delay. It really is a fantastic benefit. And there are more on the way, or so I'm told. Looking forward to hearing what they're going to be. Now, looking at the calendar, uh, we've got a bit of downtime for a weekend before the second half of the season fires into life with a number of events. One which is due to take place at Cadwell Park on the 22nd, 23rd of July. I'm sure We'll be discussing that along with a host of other topics uh, when we're back on the airwaves in less than two weeks' time. As always, there's lots to be excited about. Well, from myself and Ian, we'd like to thank you for joining us here uh, again here on the Barking Mad podcast. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks for episode four, where we'll be back with more guests and more racing chat. And if you're totally barking mad... <laughs> You might want to watch us as well as listen to us on the normal podcast channels. You can watch us on the BARC's YouTube channel. In the meantime, don't forget to stay up to date with all the latest news on the BARC website and social media channels. So until next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>